You know, my story is, is that um, my grandfather came to this country in, um, in 1906, $12 in his pocket. We all have our stories of yeah. how our, you know, ancestors came here. But he came here and first went and um, fought in World War One. came back from the war and uh, opened a restaurant, built a restaurant. He was a construction guy in Italy. And um, they called it a laborer. And yeah. he um, came back from the war, uh, built uh, a building. Um, they named it the Rex Manor uh, after the ship, the Rex, which was a, a ship that would transport Italians from Italy to America. So it was very much um, an, an upbringing of hard work. Um, and, you know, I worked at my dad's restaurant. That was my first job. I was the coat check girl at the Rex Manor. <laughs> and, you know, just seeing my father work so hard, my mother work so hard, in Diker Heights, it was it was a beautiful upbringing. I mean, I I love that neighborhood so much. I, I I'm so grateful for the upbringing in in Diker Heights. And apparently, they called you Bullet because you're extremely fast. I know you're a fast run. Are you still a fast runner? Yeah, I'm. Um, was always the fastest runner on the block. We would play uh, manhunt, and then we would play as a little girl. We would play RCK, run, catch, kiss. And I never wanted anybody to catch out to me to kiss me. So I was so fast. And I, uh, they started calling me Bullet. And I loved that nickname, Bullet. That was my name growing up. So. I like that. I like that. No kisses. Too fast for the boys. Yeah, right. for the boys. <laughs> <laughs> and no Catholic girls' schools. So. That's right. <laughs> yeah, St. Bernadette and Fontbonne Hall Academy in Brooklyn, yeah. Was it where your parents really strict, like, in going to an all-girls Catholic school? Like, was, was the upbringing, like, I mean, obviously you had to work, it sounds like. Was it a strict? upbringing or was it kind of loose in terms of like the way you were able to go out and, and I guess be about? I think my parents were strict, but not to the extent that it was too strict. Like, for example, I wasn't allowed to take car service. All my friends would take car service. My mother would not allow me to take car service. It wasn't like Uber on your phone, but you <laughs> call car service. Yeah. Um, and my mom didn't like that. So I wasn't allowed to do that. Um, and, and anything I needed to do or I wanted to do, I had to raise the money to do it, which was such an incredible lesson as a young girl. I remember as a five or six year old, I would hear, you know, Mr. Softy outside the ice cream truck. And I would say, Mom, the tr the ice cream truck is here. Can I go get a cone? And she would say, sure, you can get the cone. But how will you pay for it? Or do you have change in your jar? And I was, ch you know, yep. um, collecting change. So they were, you know, strict, but not really that strict. So I always had to work. That was definitely one of the rules. You always had to have a job. You had to be disciplined, but it wasn't like one of these households where it was like kind of militant. No, no, no. I mean, yeah. look, we would go. When I came of age, we would go uh, into New York City. And, you know, Brooklyn and Diker Heights was close enough to the city, but far enough that you felt like you were in a suburb. You felt like yeah. you, but you also felt like you were in the big city. So it was it was a great mix. What was it a big deal to go into the city? Was it like, yeah. hey, we're going to the city. That was like a big day out or a big night out to actually go into Manhattan? Absolutely, yeah. And yeah. that's what I mean when I say I wasn't allowed to take car service. My mom would want my dad to drive us. And my father was running a restaurant. He couldn't drive us, so... Right. Um, and that was just because that was like she didn't know the person. She, my mom didn't trust it. She just didn't trust it. Didn't trust anybody. Yeah, like a good <laughs> old time woman. Well, yeah, don't don't trust anyone. Skeptical. Yeah, yeah, skeptical yeah. of everything. Yes, yes. That's one of my mom. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Do you think <laughs> she's silly? She lives with me now. I love her dearly. My, yeah, Josephine, my dear right? Josephine. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing is, my mom did. Uh, I thought was so important is she made any problem that I had the whole family's problem. And I remember when I was a young girl and I had a boyfriend and he wanted to break up with me. And I was so upset. I was downstairs in the basement crying my eyes out. And she came down. She said, what's the matter? I said, oh, he wants to break up. He said he wants to see other people and all this blah, blah, blah. And she said, oh, you know, she's tried to console me about it. And she and I said, OK, but mom, please don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. I don't want to talk about this. Don't tell right. anyone. As soon as she went upstairs, I hear her telling my brother, telling my sister, <laughs> telling my father. Everybody's talking about the breakup. Wait. wait. <laughs> and I was like, I just told her not to tell anybody. And she's telling the entire family. But in retrospect, what an incredibly powerful message. My problem was my entire family's problem. And that is what I always knew. So I always knew that I could shoot for the stars because... Even if I failed, I would I would land on my Chanel's and my family would help me. And I think a lot of people don't have that growing up, right? That they're like those limiting beliefs for a lot of people. It sounds like you didn't have because you had this like this freedom to to really decide like, hey, and do you think that played into your desire to go into journalism? And... Well, that was also my mother. Um, when I was at NYU, I was studying economics and I just did well in economics. So I just kept taking classes. I had no idea where that would lead. I didn't know. Economics led to Wall Street or economics led to business. No idea. I just was doing well in it. And I said, well, I'll just take it again. I'll take statistics. I'll take stats too. 
And suddenly in the middle of it all, my mother said to me, Marie, I think you should take journalism. I think you'd be good at it. And this was me. I was a junior at NYU. I said, well, let me check it out. And I did. I took a class called the Featured Article at NYU, and I absolutely loved it. I realized that was my calling. I loved writing. I loved journalism. And so I switched my major. And and because I had business as a backdrop, because that was initially my major, uh, it sort of set me up to go into business journalism when I started my career. Were you good at math and good? Because I feel like a lot of those econ courses and finance courses, it's very, what is that, right brain versus left brain? I became good at math, Ryan, but I didn't start. I was was horrible. In fact, I remember when I saw my math teacher from high school somewhere after I had been on the air and I was a a markets and um, business reporter at CNBC, she said to me, I'm stunned. You follow business and math. What? And I said, I know, Mrs. King, I can't believe it myself. Yeah. Because I was horrible in math. But when I got to college, I don't know, it came easy to me and I became good at math. Which begs the question, did working at the betting parlor (laughs) parlay into... Uh, understanding markets as well. That's like a very interesting place to work. I think it did. And the reason that I worked at OTB on Saturdays is because my mom worked there. She got me the job. And it was an excellent job. I was making $19 an hour as a, as a wow. girl. Wow. Yeah. It was $19 an hour at OTB. And uh, like yes, $40 I, an hour now, by the way. I, I, in inflation I, adjusted. I mean, yeah. Then, so at, at the time, my mom was very interested in um, working with money. She worked at OTB. She worked at the track. She worked at Roosevelt. She worked at uh, Meadowlands. Um, she worked at a lot of um, racing uh, places in addition to her full-time job at OTB. And so I think that also planted a seed for me to be in the middle of the action. And so yeah. when I got the opportunity to go down to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, it was like, of course I want to go. I, I love this. <laughs> knowing that my mom was so uh, knee-deep in, in you know counting money and knowing money and <laughs> At OTB. And my mom and my dad, they were not gamblers. They were never gamblers. They're on the business side. Right. Yeah, you're, but my you're mom the house. did have the job and yeah. she enjoyed it. I mean, if my mom lost two dollars on a bet, she was upset the whole day. So she like <laughs> wouldn't um yeah, you know, she wouldn't put money on, on horses, but it was a good job for her and for the family. Well, I mean there must have been so many characters. I mean O T B is like I think that old school, like on the corner. Um, you know, use like a green awning or something like that. Like, I mean, were the characters that went into those places must have been during the day. It must have been such an interesting environment, I would think. It was funny. I mean, I remember um, leaving high school, getting on the bus, getting off the bus on 86th Street and 5th Avenue in Brooklyn, and then stopping into OTB to see my mom before I walked home. Yeah. And so I had my, you know, um, Catholic girls uniform on, <laughs> walking in a place which was filled with smoke, everybody smoking cigarettes. Yes. And I'm looking behind the window, which window is my mom at? They would buzz me in. I would go in the back. And my mom would take a break for five minutes. I would catch up with her and then say, all right, mom, I'm going to go walk home. I'll see you later when you get home. It, it was such a naive and beautiful upbringing. And to see my mom working at OTB, you know, she is still my hero. She's always been my hero. Watching her work incredibly hard, whatever it takes to bring a paycheck home to raise her family. So that's what she did. And then just to give you just the, the the license to go out there and make your way in the world, I think that's, I mean, I think probably as a woman in those days too, that had to be like ahead of a head of a curve, right? I mean, yeah. who was letting their daughter just go out there and, and dream and do what they want to do? And, and, and my mom always told me, don't rely on anyone. Make sure you oh, do it yourself. Yeah. Don't rely on anyone. Be financially independent. And that's what she did. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, I think money is a means for independence more than anything else, right? As opposed to, like, I can buy nice things. That's like superfluous compared to like being able to be like, hey, I can do what I want. I can help the people that I want and kind of dictate the way, you know, I want to live life the way I want to live it, I feel like. That's like the, the key there. It's true. And I think it's really an important lesson for a young girl. Um, yeah. To know that uh, there are no shortcuts. If you work hard, you will succeed. And if you uh, prepare, you will succeed. My mom wrote me a note that I have on my bulletin board at home still. She wrote, excellence comes through preparation. And I'll never forget that as well. My mom has given me so many incredible lessons from financial independence to preparation. Um, I, I, I'm in huge debt to my mom. Uh, for all of the incredible lessons that she's uh, left with me. And my father, too. My father was incredibly hardworking. He he was never home. We were always at the restaurant because you can't, you're married to the restaurant when you're in the restaurant you, business. Yeah. Did you learn some of your social skills from just like working at the, uh, checking coats in and having sure. to all the people coming in? Was that, was that part of like just building the, 
the ability just, you know, to connect with people. This was my first job. I had no idea. I mean, I was I was shy at one point, you know. I mean, really? Yeah. I've never was, seen uh, anyone. You work the room. You're good at working the room. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the show, I know when the show's on when you walk in the room. After I figured out how to deal with people and how to give them their coats back and be responsible with their property, uh, <laughs> I, I lost some of the shyness. But that's also a really important lesson. I always tell young people, no job is a bad job. You're learning something in everything. I mean, I'm over here needing to protect people's coats, needing to ensure that I, you know, protect their property and then give them back. Um, I have their my sign, my original sign in my office at home. Yeah. And it says, 50 cents, 50 cents a coat, please pay in advance. And that was another lesson. Get the money up front. Yeah. So, Maria, I mean, you know, it, I, I get the impression that you work really hard. I mean, I heard you say that you're up at 3 a.m. every day. You're working six days a week. And, you know, you're, you've been massively successful. So, I mean, at this point in your life, you know, you probably are financially independent, but do you still feel that desire every day that, you know, you're going to fail if you don't get up and go to work? I do. I, I love what I do. And I think that's one of the most important uh, pieces to how I've been successful. And that is loving what you do. I mean, I, I you know, I, I don't think I could be as successful, work as hard as I do if I didn't love it. And, um, you know, I think that's uh, one of the secrets to success, you know, throw whatever you can at the wall, see what sticks, see what you love, see what gets you up in the morning and gets you excited. And that's what I did. And that's why I don't have a problem with getting up early. I love my schedule, actually. Um, and I, um, I I'm learning something new every day. So it's it's invigorating. I'm surprised you said you love your schedule because I was going to ask you I, from what I read. And you can tell me this is correct. You're up by three, three thirty. Um, you literally, I mean, by nine o'clock you finish your show. So that's already six hours of the day done. You're doing 13 hours a day. You've got three shows you do every week. You're on for six days a week. I don't think there's a journalist out there that has that schedule. I mean, it's so grueling, uh, but you just said you love it. So like, what is it about your schedule that you love? And like, how do you counterbalance that with like, I don't know, like social time and downtime? Cause that just seems like literally insane to me. Well, I, I do like what I do. So that's right there makes it easier. Um, but I like having the fact that I can be done early. I mean, yes, the yeah. show ends at yeah. 9 o'clock. Normally, I'll do phone calls to prepare for tomorrow, prepare for future interviews after the show. So I don't really consider myself done until like 10 or 10, 30, 11 even sometimes. It depends on the, the meetings that I have after the show. Mm -hmm. But I like the idea that after 11 in the morning, I can decide, do I want to go and have lunch with someone? Yeah. Do I want to go and make phone calls? Do I want to go and goof off and go shopping? Do I want to go and, and take a nap? It's up to me what I want to do in the afternoon. And I like that. I mean, yes, it does affect the nighttime hours because I do try to get in bed by 830. Gotta have to. I'll do, if I know that I have a birthday dinner or something important that I want to go to at night, um, I'll take a nap. So I just like bank hours of sleep. Okay, I got three I hours there. That's in the bank. I had another two hours there. <laughs> Um, but you can't go out every night. You just can't. It just doesn't work well with the schedule. Yeah. Does that bother you? Like you don't really even care. You're, you're happy in bed by eight thirty, or is it like, uh, oh, I'm missing this like great event going on at Cipriani or something like that. Or are you just happy like it's fine for you? It's fine for me. I, I don't yeah. care. I mean, it used to bother me. I used to want to go to everything. I remember saying, oh, I really want to go to that. I'm going to try to do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. And then when the time comes, you're like, no, I'm too tired. I'm not doing any of that. <laughs> I'm going home. <laughs> Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 153, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, and you want a more hands-on approach, Bob, Chris, and I now have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you with your planning and investing. This is what we do every single day. We'll put together for you a total financial master plan. We'll do a bird's eye view of your entire financial life and hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front. In fact, we'll build you your own personalized financial portal. We'll go through and look at everything you need from an income plan for retirement. How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you take social security? We'll do a full deep dive of your total portfolio. Look at your diversification. Have you had way too much money in the market? Have you seen your portfolio go up and down like a yo-yo or have you been sitting in cash, paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do? We'll put together a full investment game plan. We'll show you how to grow your wealth, tie to your goals, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, insurance product, structured product, brokerage product. We'll do a deep dive of all those investments. 
show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's now what you make. It's what you take. You'll get a full tax playbook. If you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or click on the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. So the 90s. I remember being in high school and all of a sudden CNBC became a thing. My dad wealth, wealth, was a wealth manager, one of the best in the business. We always had CNBC on in our household. I don't know <laughs> other people watch. We watch CNBC. And you being the first person ever on the floor, I mean, it created this like, and it's kind of like when Wall Street went to Main Street, right? Everyone had their E-Trade account, proliferation of just like online <laughs> trading. Everyone was into it. And now you have this exciting component. You're the first person, forget man or woman, on the stock exchange with these old school brokers. Um, you know, like Kenny Paul Carey, I always think of just like, you know, like the real deal out there on the floor. Um, what was it like? And you were on all these big talk shows. I mean, you were the epitome of the ni- late, mid to late 90s uh, the stock market. It must have been heady days. What was it like? It was incredible. It really was. Um, I think that when I first got down to the floor of the exchange, a lot of people did not want me there. You know, they not only am I a woman in a sea of suits, but we also uh, understand that it's a camera and I'm the media. And, you know, these guys had been doing their business the way they were doing it for years. And yeah. So there I am saying, well, wait, the stock is going to open this way and, you know, putting us putting a spotlight on it. It was incredibly exciting, interesting to be the first person down there to actually bring cameras on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Thank God for Dick Grasso. Dick was so wonderful. He wanted to. Uh, demystify what was going on on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. So he okay. he wanted to educate the public. He he thought there were 100 million individual investors. We're going to show them more than just the opening bell and the closing bell. So um, we mm-hmm. said, let's try to get a camera on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. At that point, everybody would go uh, above the floor on like a little balcony. So when Dick said yes, we thought, oh, my God, this is amazing. Let's do it. And like I said, initially, people didn't want me there. And, you know, the camera was so far. So I had my spot and the camera was really, really far. I remember that because it was looking all the way down at you. Yeah. Zoom into me. So for the most part, a lot of people did not know when I was actually live on television. So it's not like they were banging into me and bumping into me on purpose. They truly did not know I was on TV. There was a portion of them who wanted to say, uh, hi, mom, you know, and they wanted to yeah, actually right. make a point. But most of them just were, I was in their way. And so that was part of the issue. And I'll, I'll never forget one time I told this story um, to a women's event at one point, and I'll share it with you. I, yeah. I was getting an award from the Financial Women's Association, and I explained what happened um, with a gentleman named Mike Rogers. Um I'm sorry, Mike Robbins. It was a gentleman named Mike Robbins. So Mike Robbins was one of the leading uh, brokers in GE stock. And he was like the father of all trading on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. I had no knowledge of any of this. One day I find out that Jack Welch is coming down to the floor of the exchange. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, what a score. My boss's boss is coming down to the exchange. And I'm going to be the one to be able to show him all around. And a, a week earlier, I had only been on the exchange a couple of weeks. A week earlier, George, the specialist in GE, okay. took me into the to the post, showed me where the buying interest was, how the stock moves, all the little, little particulars about GE stock, where the volume is. And I thought, oh, Jack is going to love this stuff. He's going to eat all this up. I'm going to take Jack over there to meet George. So one day I walk over to the post of GE and I say, George, to tell him about Jack. And this one guy, Mike Robbins, went crazy on me. He's like, get out of here. Run along. This is not for your little TV show. Oh We're doing real business here. And I'm standing there. I mean, I'm, what, 25, 26. I've got all these guys staring at me. They're waiting for a response, waiting for a fight. So, you know, you have the knots in your stomach. You don't really know how to respond. Yeah, so yeah, I just aggressive. said, don't speak to me that way. And then I basically <laughs> turned around and I ran along. I left. And But I went back and I kept going back. Anyway, George, I later found out, was on the board of the New York Stock Exchange, was fully against any cameras on the floor, did not want me there, hated me, in fact, thought I was this person doing a little TV show. So I called Dick Grasso. I said, Look, listen, Dick, this is not right. We just had a b- major incident on the floor. All I did was say, George, and this crazy guy comes over to me, starts yelling at me, pushes me out of, you know, telling me, get out of here. So he goes, all right, Marie, come up after the close, and you're going to meet Mike Robbins. Okay. So there I am in Dick Grasso's office, the chairman and CEO of the New York Stock Exchange, sitting oh my God. with one of the leading brokers, Mike Robbins, 
who was on the board. So I say, look, Mike, I'm sorry if I got in your way. I just wanted to you know, talk to George, blah, blah, blah. I'm, not, I'm explaining myself. Yeah. He goes, look, I haven't seen your little TV show, but Ooh. don't you come around me. Don't you come near me. Make sure I don't see you, and you should be fine. What a jerk. So I said, oh, okay. So I left, and um, Dick said to me, listen, Maria, there are a lot of people who want you here. There are a lot of people who don't. And Mike Robbins does not want you here. So be careful of Mike Robbins. Stay out of his way. He's got he's the leading broker on the floor and he's the biggest mover in GE stock. Don't go near him. OK, I would go around the building just not to pass Mike Robbins. Every time I passed Mike, he had another comment for me. And I was late. I had to get on air because we were doing hits for CNBC like every hour. Every time I passed yeah. Mike, he would say something like this. <laughs> Save your money. Like. Save your money. You'll never amount to anything. How did that make you feel? I would ignore it. And I would just. I, I, did it bother I felt, you? Yes. I felt yeah. really bothered by it. So one day, dot com is crashing. <laughs> I got to get to my spot. Yeah, right. Okay? I have to go on live five minutes ago. I'm late. I can't walk around the building. I got to walk right by Mike Robbins. So I walk by him. Sure enough, on cue. <laughs> save your money. I turned around to him and I said, no, you save your money. And I thought, <laughs> yes, I got Mike Robbins back. Anyway. What happened was I did bring Jack Welch over to George. George did explain everything in Jack, to Jack Welch. I did keep going back to George. And I kept, I said to myself that day, you know what? I need to own this job. I need to own this job. I need to make sure I know more about trading and markets than every one of these guys. They're not going to have anything on me. Because the problem with um, Mike Robbins was because he was such a big guy yeah. in terms of importance and the biggest trader in GE, Anybody he saw me talking to, that guy got a talking to later. So he was like ruining my credibility and on the ostracizing floor. Ostracizing you on the Ostracizing floor. me, right. So yeah, I was yeah. like, okay, okay, I can't get any of these guys in trouble. I spoke to that guy earlier. I don't want, you know, uh, George to, I, I, I don't want um, Mike Robbins to know. Long story short. Yeah. Finally, Mike Robbins leaves the floor. And I'm like, oh, I'm so happy Mike Robbins is leaving the floor. I'm not going to get harassed anymore. This is perfect. About six months later, I'm invited to a party that Goldman Sachs is hosting. Uh, the vice chairman of Goldman Sachs, Bob Hormatz, invites me. He says, Maria, it's my retirement party. Can you come? I said, absolutely. I'd love to come. It's at this great restaurant, Daniel Restaurant in Manhattan. Yeah. I go with Bob Hormatz to go to Daniel Restaurant, and we're celebrating. I'm like, I'm thinking, oh, I have a whole pocket full of cards. I'm going to meet a ton of sources now, all the Goldman Sachs guys. Um, <laughs> this is going to be great. So as I'm there saying, I'm going to meet that person. I'm going to talk to that person. I'm going to schmooze this person. Who do I see walk in? Mike, Mike Robbins. Robbins. <laughs> oh, my God. This is a nightmare. He's going to mortify me in front of everybody right now. He's going to yell at me. Watch. So I'm like, that's oh it. God. I've done enough. I've met enough people. I'm out of here. I'm not staying anymore. I was, I was leaving. As I'm walking out, on my shoulder. Maria? It's Mike Robbins. No I way. I said, oh, hello. How are you? And I'm like, great. I'm waiting for it. He goes, I want you to know something. I haven't seen your little TV show. But I read no. your column in Bloomberg Business Week. You're doing a good job. What? I was like, wow. Like, I took such a breath. I was so happy that I had had a column in Business Week before Bloomberg merged with it. I had the column, yeah. and he was reading it. And he thought it was good. And I thought, that's all I needed. I said, Mike, thank you so much. Bygones be bygones. We shook hands, and that was it. I was finally done Just with like Mike that. Robbins. And you know what? I share that story all the time with young people because I want to make sure they know. You didn't get here by coincidence, okay? Yeah. You didn't get here on Wall Street, at the corner table, in the corner office, by coincidence. You earned that seat at the table. Know it, own it, and live like it. You own it. And so that's why I think it's really important for people to understand my journey, working yeah. hard, overcoming some of this stuff, and it'll be okay. But just keep pursuing your truth. Yeah. And it could be summed up as you can take the girl out of Brooklyn, but you can't take the Brooklyn out of the... That's right. I love Brooklyn. So 30 years, I mean, I guess at that point you were maybe 20 years in on air, right? It was about 2013. Um, you made this big leap and you went over to Fox Business, which at the time was relatively shocking because you were you know, so much associated with CNBC. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, I think um, partly it was because I was coming up to my 20th anniversary at CNBC. And so, you know, with round numbers, you start thinking, well, is this, you know, the right time to think about something else? And so I had done three contracts. They wanted me to do another contract okay. um, after 20 years. And I thought to myself, okay, 
I'm going to lock myself up for another four or five years right now. Is this what I want to be doing? So I had been at that point talking to managers and CEOs and, you know, managers of businesses, and they would all tell me the same thing. They would say, Maria, it's too short-term oriented. We don't care what the whisper number is anymore. We're not in the 90s anymore. You need to go long term. And so I thought, well, that makes a lot of sense to me. People didn't want just knee-jerk reactions. You know, the dot-com generation, we're not in the dot-com uh, era anymore. Yeah. So I went, exactly, I went yeah. to my boss and I said, look, Mark, I've been hearing from a lot of CEOs, they think we're too short-term oriented and they want us to do long-term. I think we should try to have a little more coverage of, you know, longer term, how to invest and save wisely for the long term, not get rich quick, yeah. you know, overnight uh, schemes. And he said to me, very flatly, very adamantly, no, we're not going to do that. Which they're still yeah. doing it the same way, by the way. He said, right, they haven't yeah. changed it. And yeah. he, said, he said, we have to speak to the trading desk. It's about the trade. What's the trade? What's the trade? And I said, yeah. every story is about what's the trade? And he said, yeah, it's what's the trade? What's the trade? And I said, wow. And I said, okay. So I walked away from that conversation saying to myself, now the decision is up to me. Do I want to be that person on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange in the next five years telling you what's the trade? What's the trade? And I realized, no, I didn't. You feel and monotonous so, and boring at some point? Well, it wasn't monotonous and boring. It was just narrow. And right. I was looking at my own portfolio and I wanted to stretch my own portfolio. Politics and policy is something that I knew zero about. When I first got to Fox, I knew nothing about politics. I knew really? I didn't know that. I knew very little about policy. I mean, I knew policy from the standpoint of how does it add to growth? Because right. at CNBC, it was like, where's the growth? Where's the growth? I traveled the world, and I'm grateful. I'm so grateful for CNBC. I did. I traveled. I went to Asia. I went to Europe. I went to, you know, I, I went to Brazil. I went to, you know, Beijing, London, uh, multiple times, Singapore. And we were always looking for the growth. And so to the extent of how policy impacts growth, I knew that. But beyond that, I didn't know anything. So I said to myself, if I took myself out of my world and put myself in another world, I, I would be, in effect, stretching myself, stretching my own portfolio. And that seemed attractive to me. But then when yeah. Mark said, no, we're not going to change. We just want what's the trade. I thought, well, I really have to decide that, you know. And then Roger Ailes made me a great offer to come help him build Fox Business. And also he was willing to give me a show on Sundays, which is what I really wanted. I wanted a show on Sundays to marry business with politics and business with policy, you know? So you and saw that as kind of the future, that you saw there was, a, there was a huge void in the market, per se, for that type of content. Yeah. yeah. I didn't realize the political tricks that are played in politics, and I didn't realize how divisive everything is. I had no idea because I've always been an independent my entire life. Yeah. Uh, I voted both ways. I never, it, it was, but when I got here and recognized all the political tricks, then I thought, wow, this is like, this is beyond. I thought, journalism and TV was competitive. Politics is blood sport. Was it a hard transition? Because this is like stuff you don't know. You're going to a whole realm of, of information. You, you're just like not savvy on. Was it like an exciting, I guess, realm we went to? Or was it like more nerve wracking? Like, I don't understand a lot of this. It's over my head. Like, what was the feelings when you first dwelled into politics in a, in a more real way where it wasn't just tied into stocks or you know, you know, I, the I market. Think initially, it was tied into stocks in the market. So initially, right. it really was. I came Leaning here as a business reporter, right? Yeah. And yeah. I leaned into what I knew. I was on Fox Business, and I did all business. And it wasn't until I tripped over the Russia collusion story that I realized, wow, they really play dirty and serious, making yeah. up a story about your political opponent and, and pushing it through federal agencies and letting it go viral or across the world, and it's not even true. I mean, that's why I was so shocked when I thought, oh, when I found out that that was made up, I didn't know Donald Trump very well. I mean, he came on CNBC a couple of times as a right. real estate guy, but I didn't have any, you know, allegiance or support or anything like that. I just, but what I saw was so unfair. I'm like, well, wait a second, this was made up? And then when I thought, well, this is viral. We're all talking about this across the world. I got to go on TV and tell everybody what I found out. I got to let everybody, I got to re- yell this from the rooftops. Guess what, guys? This is made up. And when I did that, then it was like so divisive. They didn't want to hear that it was made up. It was like, no. So that's yeah. when I really turned on thinking, wow, well, there are a lot of political tricks being played here. I figured I'd make it very exciting as a journalist, too, because that's a lot of interesting uh, topics to get into. And and my principles wouldn't allow me to just sit back and not say anything. I mean, right. I, had, yeah. I, I thought, well, wait a second. This was made up. I'm not going to report on this without saying what I know. I can't. My principles wouldn't allow it. 
And so that's when things got, I think, um, very divisive. Do you think that just that time things became more divisive or they're always divisive, um, but you just start reporting on how divisive it was? Well, it was just that I just learned it. I didn't know. Yeah, right. I didn't yeah. know about because I came from CNBC for 20 years looking up where's the growth? Where's the growth? What's the trade? Not right. realizing that in politics, it's very different. There there are a lot of um, lies and misinformation there. There is. It's uh, part of the the story. And also, I feel like when you dwell into politics, you get more criticism. Right. How do you deal with the backlash and criticism? Because when you're at your level, I mean, that stuff is pretty real. Are you able to just ignore it and just report the way you're reporting? Or does it affect you? Is it something that you actually have to deal with emotionally you know, getting the backlash? Well, I do ignore it, but you're right. It is hurtful. Um, you know, yeah. all I can do is do what I do and I'm not going to um, I'm not going to go along with, you know, uh, the herds uh, and the sheep uh, and not um, use my own, um, you know, mind to figure things out and to think things out. I'm an independent thinker. I've always been that way. Kind of like you going on the floor for the first couple times, the same type of, uh, uh, right. you know, yeah. You, that's right. I went yeah. and and that's I thought about that. I said, yeah. you know what? I battled the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. These people are not going to uh, run me off the road. I don't think so. But, you know, I, and I don't know what it is, that, you know, that je ne sais quoi of like when you're on and you're on and you were driving that show, it just feels different. Like I can't put my finger on it. Like the way you drive the show, I mean, let's face it, your competition, they have three hosts. You're one person. They have three hosts that compete against you on another morning show, which is kind of insane to think about. It's a show that's just you driving it as like a force of nature. Like, have you ever sat down and just analyzed, like, what is that difference? Like, what is that? It, it's an emotional thing. Like, I remember one time I was doing the show with you. We're like, at the end of the show, you're like, yeah, I noticed it got a little slow and we need to pick up the pace. And I felt like you could feel that you were like, all right, in your mind, like, this is not going the way I want it to go today. Like, we need to change the momentum of this. Like, have, have you ever, like, just sat down and analyzed what is the difference between why you've had such longevity why there is a certain like charisma and an energy when you're driving the, the show versus someone else. And I mean, there's so many people that have probably come and gone in your career that you've just like, compl I've completely forgotten about. Right. But you're still here and you're still driving like you've always been driving. Well, thank you for that. Um, I, I, I think I'd like to think that um, my guests trust me. I mean, that that I'm not going to waste their time, that they know that they're going to get an interview that is um um, well thought out and prepared. Um, I, I think that's one of the things that, that that's why people talk uh, to me. And, and I think the guests are important. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I love having you on because I know you know your stuff. Thanks. And I know that, you know, when, when we're talking about investing, you've done the work. And so I can throw whatever question at you and you're going to handle it and you're going to know where to go with it. That's how I decide on, you know, who's coming on and, uh, you know, decide on what I want to ask in many cases. I mean, of course, I have an amazing team that that helps with all of that. Um, but I think um, viewers know that I'm going to do the work beforehand. And so and I'm not afraid to go towards subjects. Oh, we know. Maybe other people would be afraid of because I'm trying to be authentic. I'm trying to be real. And I and I don't I, I think one thing I've learned in television is that when you try to be someone that you're not, you're busted immediately. The Ooh, audience sees right through it. So what's most important is to just be yourself and be authentic. And th that's what people really want to see. Because if they feel like, you know what, I don't think she's telling me the truth. They're out of there. But if she th if they think, you know what, I'm learning something from her because she's telling me the real deal. She's telling me how she actually sees it. Then there's a trust factor there. Do you feel like to really amplify and be Maria to the fullest on camera, like, does it take time to develop that? Because you're right, when the camera's off, you're kind of the same person. Like if you're, yeah, I can tell you're like, you know, feisty on a certain day. It doesn't really change when the camera's on and off. But I think that's not something that's like easily attainable. I think I think it's a great observation. Um, it does take time. You're right. It, it takes time to be comfortable with yourself, to yeah. be able to share yourself. For the longest time, I never would give anything away. And people wanted to hear more. I remember my boss. What do you mean by that? By the they, way? they didn't, I didn't give anything away in terms of my personal life in terms of how uh -huh. I felt about things. Right. I was always like, um, you know, straight straight down the line in terms of what we're talking about. But you really wouldn't get my personality. And I had people, colleagues, bosses tell me, Maria, people want to hear you, what you really think about. And I was uncomfortable 
with giving myself, get, opening my world up, opening myself up to an audience. I had to learn how to do that, learn how to be comfortable with it. How did you learn to do that? Like, what were the steps to do that? I'm really curious because that's that's a big deal and a big leap. I think it's experience. I think it's knowing that, you know what, it's okay to make a mistake. You know what, let me correct myself. That's not what I meant. You know what, I don't know the answer to that. So when I ask you a question, I, I don't know. Vulnerability. I don't know. Yeah, show your vulnerability. It's okay not to know everything. It's okay to make a mistake, correct it. And so those are the kinds of things that one gets comfortable with over time through experience. And it's, you know... Also, when the cameras are rolling and the lights are on, all of a sudden people stiffen up. You just think you're in like a different yeah, yeah, yeah. backdrop. You're experience. in a different environment. Yeah, we all have. Um, when you recognize it's just you and you are talking the way you would be talking without the camera, without the lights, you have to just get over that. And once you recognize that the person likes you, the viewer wants you for who you are, then you realize it's actually not even a question. You have to be yourself. It's all about self-acceptance at the end of the day. Well, you have to be comfortable in your own skin. Yeah. And I think that takes time. It, it, it requires experience. You're not going to know everything right away. You're not going to understand that, you know what? It's okay to trip. Just get up. Yeah, totally. I'm, I'm so happy you made that transition over to Fox because it's, uh, it, it really is informative and helps people. Uh, in terms of achieving your financial goals, because it's, you know, anybody makes a good trade, uh, you know, I don't know, are you lucky or smart? And that's the only thing right. you got to figure out. Well, thank you. And I saw that happening early on that, you know what, people uh, don't want this, not the way to invest. You know, people don't want that. I mean, today on the show, we had such an important discussion, I thought, about investing in defense and technology. And, you know, we, we looked at it broadly speaking about the world getting more dangerous and, you know, communist China getting more aggressive and Vladimir Putin aggressive. And, and we, we zeroed it down to how do you look at this scenario to try to figure out where the growth in business is or how to invest around it long term? We had a great guest to talk about that drone technology. And I, mean, I think from my standpoint, and I know you're, you know, smarter and much more you know, um, researched on this than I am at this point. But I think when I'm investing today, I want to do two things, look for growth in two areas. Number one, it's defense technology because the national security issues and the personal security issues are not going away. So, you know, how do you make money on this, you know, evolving more dangerous world? And number two, the marriage of healthcare and technology. You know, right. we're living yes. longer and, and biotech and all of these things for me are areas that are, Right for not just investment, but growth, long-term growth. Yeah. So I'm always looking for long-term growth stories. Well, understanding the macro, I think, is way more important. As we learned last yes. year, knowing that we weren't going to recession was very helpful. Yes, right. and you said that from day one. Yeah. And you were so spot on on that. You just have these brilliant guests on. I don't know what it know. is. It's just pick the right people. <laughs> uh, which, by the way, that, that is a great story. So there's never been a journalist, I don't think ever, I'm a huge Ramones fan, that Joey Ramones ever wrote a song about them and I only discovered this like a year ago. I'm like, oh, my God, there's a song called Maria Bartiromo. You, you got to tell us the story. It, it, it's got to be a phenomenal story. I was sitting in my office at CNBC and I kept getting emails from someone named Joey Ramone. And I didn't think it was that Joey Ramone at all. It's like when Elon yeah. Musk emails me and I know it's not really Elon Musk. <laughs> but I, but I, I would answer because I always answered viewers. So, you know, he was asking me, you know, what do you think about Amazon? What do you think about this? This was in the, the, the birth of dot com. Amazon yes. was just going public. Google had just gone public. And we were all assessing the dot com field. What people don't understand and really don't know about Joey Ramone is that he was an incredible investor. He was very smart in terms of investing. He did work. He did a lot of homework. So he would email me and say, here's what I've learned about Amazon. What do you think about this? And I was getting we were like pen pals. Then he emails me and he says, Marie, I just want you to know I wrote a song about you. And I thought, oh, how nice. And then I'm thinking, wait a minute. You finally connected the dots. Like, then I connect the, the dots. Joe this is, I, I said, yeah. call me. So he calls me and he says, yeah, I, it's me, Joey. And I said, I'm so sorry. I have to apologize. I did not know that you were that Joey Ramone. I'm talking to you about stocks this whole time. I wasn't, I didn't realize. Just some dude emailing. And so he said, well, I want you to know I wrote a song about you and I'm going to play it tonight at CBGB's oh in God. the village. He goes, I want you to come. And I, and I go, oh, wow, okay. I said, well, now, at that time I was on Squawk Box. I was getting up even earlier than I get up now. I was getting up literally at 3 a.m. And 
I, he said, be, I'll be on stage at midnight. Be there at midnight. And I said, there's absolutely no way I can be at CBGB's in the village at midnight tonight. Uh, I said, I'd be like, I, I would have to take off. I can't take off. Um, so he goes, all right, well, at least send a camera crew down. I said, okay, I'll send a camera. And then I, I, go, I said, I'll come another time. Absolutely. I it just, I don't know what I was thinking. It was ridiculous. Yeah, I yeah. should have pulled an all-nighter, obviously. Obviously, I should have gone to CBGB's, gone on stage with Joey Ramone, had him play my song, and then go on air. And I didn't do that because I was afraid to pull an all-nighter. Yeah, yeah. And so, That's a wild place, too, by the way. It was a wild place back in the day. I actually well, played there once. When the, yeah. when the crew came back with the tape, and I'm looking at the Ramones playing Maria Bartiromo on stage. I'm dying. I'm like, oh, my God. So I um, called him back, and I said, this is an incredible honor. I, please, can you come on my show? And he goes, yes, I'm going to come on your show, and I'm going to play the song on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. I said, that's awesome. Oh, so now God. we're trying to get a date. I didn't know at all that he was so sick. Yeah. I had, he didn't tell me. He, I had no idea. So we said, oh, yeah, we'll do it in six months. We'll do it in three months. We're just coming up with a date. No, I can't do it this day. Okay, we'll do it in two weeks later. And then he dies. Uh, so and I was so upset. So another little gem of advice to those young people, pull the all-nighter, okay? When something happens to you, you gotta say yes that to is so incredible, you don't sit around asking for a date in the next six months. You just yeah. grab the opportunity by the horns and do it. So I do regret um, not going and seeing Joey on the floor, uh, on uh, CBGB stage. Um, but Yeah, I regret it too. Like, here's hearing it. It's kind of sad. He was, he was an amazing guy. Yeah, so I have the original um, lyrics that he wrote on pieces of paper. It was sold at auction and I bought it. Uh, who else did you buy? <laughs> yeah, I would have bought it. It says, right? it says on, and it's hanging up in my in my TV room right now. Um, and it, it says, Marie and B, and I'll tell you, it is just uh, jam-packed with F-bombs. It's great. <laughs> Don't F and walk into her. She'll get, you know, you're in the way. Her eyes make everything okay. I mean, it's just good. So he was just scribbling down lines, and um, I've got all of the as he put the song together, and I and I love it. So I have that. <laughs> I think he's kind of right, is the eyes. You have that direct <laughs> contact. You're like, yeah. Oh, wait. We ask all our guests this. Um, when you're younger, if there's one song or album, I'm a big music uh, enthusiast um, that you heard, and when you heard it, it changed your whole perception on the way you thought about life. Well, as you were saying the question, I thought, "Oh, this is easy," but then as you ended the question, I mean, it's not as easy. But my first instinct was "Sound of Music." The Sound of Music is really? my number one uh, favorite film of all time, and I think it's because my mom went to see it when she was pregnant with me, and oh. um, she watched it while she was pregnant. And I, I mean, I love that movie so much and um awesome. every song in it is amazing um you know what do you how do you solve a problem like maria is a good one um uh, but all the all the music There's in sub, that in that album subliminal messages when you're younger <laughs> yeah um and i also just love the story because here you have a, a general in the middle of world war ii who does the right thing and 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 tries to escape with his family and uh it's just the whole thing I, I i love that movie and i love that that album perfect beautiful well thank you great interview i really appreciate you guys having me